Okay, now it's important. So the, you see over and over again, Jesus calming the storm. You know, Peter uh, walking on water when it's a storm. You know, Jesus coming at night and missed the storm and they've been rowing against the wind all night. That's because the, the storms coming off the Mediterranean were unpredictable. You didn't know they were coming until they were upon you real quick. Okay, so Jesus did most of his time in, in the northern part in Galilee. Capernaum was kind of his home base. He goes to Capernaum all the time. Okay, so Peter first, his first appearance in the gospel history is in John chapter 1. Uh, the next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. They looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. Remember, he, the day before he baptized Jesus, John, did, John the Baptist did, saw the Spirit come, descend in bodily form like a dove, heard the Father speak from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Okay? And the next day, Jesus is walking by again where John is preaching and baptizing. And John, hey, guys, there's the Lamb of God. Okay? The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. How do you tell time? First hour is at six o'clock in the morning. So six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Fourth hour, right? 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 12th hour. The 10th hour is about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Getting late in the day, all right? Uh, one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You should be called Cephas, which means Peter. So very early. And John is baptizing in the Jordan River, probably pretty far north in the Jordan. Because remember, it's the Jordan that connects the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea. And John didn't stay just in one place. Why was John... Remember when he confronted Herod about Herod's immorality and everything, King Herod? Herod Antipas, uh, he was in the southern part of the Jordan River toward Jerusalem because all the people were coming to the festival. That's where the people were. So he went to the Jordan River at the crossing where the people were coming. Okay? Uh, if you don't remember that, you see the boundary of the Jordan River here in Samaria? So here is Galilee, and here's Samaria. The people so despise the Samaritans if they're traveling north and south, because Jerusalem's down here, they would cross out of Galilee over the other side of the Jordan, travel down this side of the Jordan till they got south of Samaria, and go back into Judah, the southern part, and bypass Samaria. They didn't want to walk through the land. They hated the Samaritans. Okay? Where they crossed, the river crossing, going back in, for the, going to Jerusalem for the festival, is where John set himself up to preach to the people that come. Same thing up here, okay? He had set himself up at a river. So he didn't stay in one place all the time. Why did they hate the Samaritans so much? Do you remember? Okay. They had intermarried with the, the Jews and they thought. When Nebuchadnezzar come, came into the land and, and took them off to <coughs> exile uh, and Daniel was carried off to Babylon, they would take people from one land and transport them to another and take them from other lands and transport them to the land they conquered so they kept the nations of people mixed up because I'm not going to fight for this land because this isn't my home. So it was a way of putting down rebellion. And the people that were brought in to Judah and, and, and everything, uh, the Jews that were left, because they, ex they exiled, took them to cap captivity, all the noblemen, all the learned and educated ones, and left basically the, the manual laborers, the field workers and stuff. These people intermarried with the foreigners who were brought in. So we're half breed Jews. Those in Babylon kept the bloodlines pure, only married amongst the Jews. So uh, Cyrus of the Medes and the Persians lets that second generation of an 80 years in Babylon, lets them come home. And uh, Ezra is gonna rebuild the temple. Nehemiah is gonna rebuild the walls of the city. They get there and all the other Jews that are there say, hey, we wanna help you. And they say, uh-uh, you're not pure blood Jew anymore. You're half-breeds. We don't want you around. You weren't faithful to God. 
So they go up into Samaria, down in this part of it, and build their own temple and worship God the best they can because the Jews said, you can't have any part of us. And there was a hatred fostered at that point that continued all the way to Jesus' day. And that's how the Samaritans came into being. Okay? So, Matthew 4, And he said to him, Said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Mark 1, And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Same thing. Luke 5, Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So Simon is still a fisherman, Andrew's told him about Jesus, but he's still a fisherman. He hasn't started following Jesus yet permanently. The names of the 12 apostles were these. First, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the, the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, he betrayed him. They appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. And when the day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles. Simon, who, was named, who he named Peter, and Andrew's brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who, be, who became a traitor. So you have all the different gospel writers giving the listing of the apostles, and Peter's in every one of them. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. And he touched her hand, and her fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. So Peter witnesses this miracle very early on. Uh, we, um, we also see that Peter's married. Paul talks about this. I wrote about this, I don't remember where I'm actually publishing right now in First Corinthians because I work ahead. Uh, when I do the weekly newsletter article, you know, do we not have the right to take along believing, a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? So what did that tell you? James, the brother of the Lord, who headed up the church of Jerusalem uh, when all the apostles fled the persecution, was married, probably. Jude, the book of Jude and the book of James in the New Testament were written by Jesus' half-brothers, the children of Joseph and Mary. James, the book of James in the Bible is not uh, this James, not James, Alf Alf son of Alphaeus, or this James. This James here, James and John, is the first apostle killed. He's beheaded in Jerusalem. He's the first apostle who dies a martyr's death. Okay? The other apostles scatter all over the world. Thomas dies in India. Some of them go into Russia. They go all over the world taking the message of the gospel. The half-brother of Jesus, James, stays in Jerusalem and is the head of the church there. He did not believe his brother was the Messiah until after the resurrection. Okay? So and he's, he, we're going to get <laughs> here in a week or two with the Sunday sermons we're doing now, which are, if you haven't caught on yet, are the resurrection appearances of Jesus. To the people and I said unexpected encounters he's appearing to all the different people after his resurrection one of them is James we're going to talk about it okay on one occasion while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret which is the Sea of Galilee and he saw two boats by the lake but the fishermen had gone out uh, out of them and were washing their nets Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from land. He sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep, into the deep, and let down your nets for a catch. Now, a couple things. Why would he need to get in the boat? <coughs> the crowds were coming. He's probably getting his feet wet anyway. <coughs> The crowds are crowding in, keep pushing, so he's right up against the lake. So he knows if he gets in the boat, they're going to stop at the water's edge. He'll have a little bit of breathing room, if you will. Then he sits down. Why? Because in the synagogues and the posture of a rabbi, you stand to read the word of God, you sit to teach the word of God. 
teacher sat to deliver his message. He stood to read, sat to teach. So Jesus sits in the boat, the position of a rabbi teaching his disciples. Okay? So, when did the fishermen normally fish? All night. We're actually going to talk about that this Sunday in the sermon. Okay? Because this Sunday's text is when Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and three other apostles, seven apostles, decided to go fishing. They're up in Galilee. Jesus hadn't shown up in a while. And Peter just says, hey guys, I'm going fishing. They say, okay, we'll go with you. And seven of them get in a little bitty boat and go fishing. Because the boats are like six foot wide. <laughs> They're not very big. And, and they go fishing, and Jesus shows up and cooks some breakfast. Okay, so we're, that's our text for Sunday. Is, you know, but they fish all night. So they've come in in the morning and are washing their nets and getting them put up till sundown when they go out to fish again. So they're mending and fishing, you know, cleaning and mending their nets, getting ready for, you know, go home and take a nap, sleep because they've been up all night fishing. And Jesus shows up and says, hey, put it back out in deep water and let down your nets again. Not what I would want to do. Okay? Simon answered, Master, we have toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. Okay. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. And they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled, filled both the boats, so they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, Lord. So the great catch of fish, okay? It's ironic that this is very early. You look at the, you know, Luke 5, very early in the ministry of Jesus. The text on Sunday, same thing. They're out fishing on the water, 100 yards out from shore. You know any fish, do you? Jesus is calling shore. They don't know it's Jesus. It's 100 yards away. It's morning, sun's coming up. I say, we've, no, we don't have anything. He said, throw your net on the other side, you'll catch some. They're on a boat this big. It's this wide. They can stand up and look at both sides. What difference does it matter which side you throw? They haven't said throw it on the right side. And there's so many fish in the net, they can't pull it into the boat. And that's when John says, ah, that's Jesus. And Peter dives in, swims 100 yards, <laughs> and gets out, and there's a fire burning with fish and bread. Already there. And the others come in the boat dragging the net of fish because they can't get it in the boat. Okay? You have a miraculous catch with Peter at the beginning and a miraculous catch with Peter at the end because it's after this one on Sunday. I'm going to talk about this. It's after breakfast that you have to text Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Tend my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Third time. And it, was, and it says Peter was grieved in his heart. But Jesus asked him again, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. He says, tend my sheep. Feed my sheep, tend my lambs, tend my sheep. But, okay, you don't see it in English. First time, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me with that self-sacrificing, all-inclusive love? Lord, you know I phileo, brotherly love, but not agape love. You know I love you like a brother. Okay, difference? To love the unlovable versus love those people who love you. Okay? Conditional, non-conditional, unconditional. Second time, Peter, do you agape me? Lord, you know I phileo you. Third time, Jesus says, Peter, do you phileo me? Do you love me like a brother? It's not in Peter yet to say I agape you. Till Pentecost. When the Spirit comes. And then Peter can talk about agape. See, the Spirit gives us the ability to love like God loves. On our own, we can't. That's part of that dialogue right after the breakfast that we talked about this coming Sunday. That's what comes next in the text. Okay. All right. Uh, so, I've been lower all night. That's uh, for breaking signal partners. You're working on a single man. Uh, for he... And all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. 
And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, from now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. That's when he starts following. He knew, you know, Andrew came and said, Peter, we found the Messiah. And he's interacted. He healed his mother. But it's not until Jesus actually calls him. Come follow me. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And Jesus, and Peter leaves everything behind and follows him. And it's not that maybe they, not that they didn't want to, but Jesus has to call him first. And Jesus calls him to be an apostle. And he answers the call. So just, these are just all the major stories. Uh, we're in Matthew 14, so about halfway. It's 28, 28 chapters of Matthew, so we're about halfway through. Remember, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are chronological. Start at the birth and work your way all the way to the resurrection and ascension. Okay? It's kind of just methodically through everything. John's different. John begins in eternity. Okay? The beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh. Verse 14. And you go through 11 chapters for three and a half years of Jesus' life. Starting with chapter 12, you start Holy Week, and you've got half the book of John dealing with one week of Jesus' life. Okay? So John does not do the chronological approach. John's gospel is set up in a pattern. There's seven I am statements in the gospel of John. Seven, out of all the miracles Jesus did, only seven miracles are talked about in the gospel of John. You need two witnesses. Seven and seven, two witnesses to the truth of who Jesus is. His I am statements and his miracles. There's, John is written with Jewish mentality to prove to the Jews Jesus is the Messiah. Okay. Uh, fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. Now this was the end of the Chosen, those episodes, where Jesus you know, comes to him in the middle of a storm, they've been rolling against the wind, can't make any headway, uh, and he comes walking on the water, the thing is a ghost. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came to Jesus. Pretty amazing. Okay? He actually did it. He walked on water. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. What, what, did he, what mistake did he make? He, eyes off. He, looked in. he looked at the circumstances of his life, and those, that became his focus instead of keeping his focus on Jesus. Is that not a metaphor for us so often? No that we are consumed by the circumstances we're in instead of keeping our focus on Jesus and his faithfulness to us. Because the moment he, moment he took his focus off of Jesus onto his circumstances, he was overwhelmed, he couldn't handle it. He began to sing. Uh, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, oh you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly you are the son of God. Now, I mentioned on Sunday, Jesus has called a lot of things. Okay, Messiah, Rabbi, heretic, blasphemer, son of God, you know, but he's never called God. So Thomas called him God. You know, so I and just I didn't put it in the sermon on Sunday, but I don't know what everybody's background is for all your life. My grandmother was old time Church of Christ non-instrumental pound the pulpit church of christ and i remember as a little kid sitting in the church with her in gainesville texas up in the up in north texas just north of Denton, just you could throw a rock in new oklahoma and the preacher on sunday morning pounding the pulpit saying thomas was a sinner thomas was not where he's supposed to be you're, if you're not in church sunday morning sunday night wednesday night you're going to be sinning just like thomas you got to be every time the doors are open or you're not faithful to god just 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 man just berating the people and as a little kid I'm thinking good grief he's scaring me to death I was like five or six okay and that's so far off it's so unfair to Thomas because Thomas gives the boldest confession of anyone in the New Testament when he says my Lord and my God so okay, John 6 John 6 is the 
um, the chapter where Jesus is doing some very deep teaching, you know, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no part of me. Okay, very deep, deep stuff. Very early in his ministry, okay? After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Now, Jesus has just given that, you know, my, my body is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed. To the Jewish mind, eat flesh and blood of a man? I mean, it is hard for them to grapple with, okay? And, and just as an aside, this is not, that section in John 6 is not the institution of the Lord's Supper. That comes in the upper room, Passover meal, Thursday night before he's crucified. But I do believe that the John 6 is a foreshadowing. Jesus is telling this is what is going to be in the future. And it finds its fulfillment in the upper room when he institutes the Lord's Supper. Okay? I believe this is Jesus saying, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my body and blood to eat and drink so you can have life. But when that time comes, and it did, in the upper room he made it very clear. This is my body, this is my blood. Okay. Uh, others turned away. Peter leads the way in remaining with Christ. So Peter, I always say he's like the bull in the china closet. He always you know, jumps first, thinks later. You know, he's very bold, very courageous. He is. Uh, but he also is the one who denies Jesus. Okay, Sometimes we get too full of ourselves. But Peter's confession comes a new name from uh, fr from Christ and the authority of apostleship. So, uh, Matthew 16. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They said to him, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, son of John, bar is son of. Okay, so bar means. Uh, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, he already told him he was going to be called Peter earlier, early on. This is when his name changes. Okay. This is when it kind of becomes official. There's a play on words. Do you know what the play on words is? Petros, Peter, means a rock, rock, but actually a pebble. The kind of thing you get your shoes aggravated? Pebble. But upon this rock, I'll build my church, huge boulder. Peter's a pebble. But the confession Peter made, you are the Christ, Son of the living God, is the rock upon which the kingdom of God is established in the world. The truth of Jesus is not Peter. See, the Roman Catholic Church takes Peter as the one who is the church is built on. Okay? But there's a, there's a definite plan of words. You're a, you're, a, you're a pebble, you're a small stone, but upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Now, is that reminiscent of everything, anything from our just past study? Nebuchadnezzar set up a statue, three men in the fiery furnace because they wouldn't worship it. What was the interpretation of the dream? Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of this huge statue, head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, torso uh, and arms of silver, Medes and Persians, brass, Alexander the Great, iron, Rome. Iron mixed with clay, the corrupted Rome that fell, when a huge boulder comes and smashes the feet, and the whole thing disintegrates into dust, and the boulder grows to encompass the entire world. The kingdom of God. Same image. This huge boulder upon which the church is built. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, I just wrote a whole series of sermons. I told you a little bit about it. Uh, on this text. This was the theme verse. Okay? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Did I tell you about that? 
it's it'll be like 10 months from now before you hear it but <laughs> i'm actually wrote a sermon this morning yesterday i wrote a sermon that is for the exact day we're coming up to the first sunday in may next year and i've written another one that's the second Sunday in May, and I got the next one done. It's almost done. It's the third Sunday in May next year. So I'm actually right at one year ahead on sermons right now. And I'm keep trying to come, I'm trying to come up with sermon ideas. But our, our, this whole idea, I, for how many years have I looked at this passage and said, upon this rock of my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The kingdom of Satan cannot win. It cannot overcome the kingdom of God. That's how I looked at it. Didn't pay attention. That's a wrong interpretation. The gates guard a city. The gates are for the protection of those inside the gates. The gates of hell will not keep the kingdom of God out. The gates of hell will crumble and the kingdom of God will win the victory. The gates are not attacking the kingdom. The kingdom is attacking the gates of hell. Okay. okay, now hold on. I gotta write this. <laughs> the gates. I cannot listen and write it. Okay, whatever. Well, think about it. You got a city that's a walled city, and you got gates like a castle. The opposing army has to batter down the gates in order to win the victory, right? You've seen it in medieval movies and stuff. The gates of hell cannot keep the kingdom of God out. Where's the kingdom of Satan? This world. Satan is the god of this world. Prince of the power of the air. That's what he's called. This is Satan's dominion. The kingdom of God has invaded enemy territory. And the gates of hell cannot keep the kingdom of God from victory. God will be victorious in the world. That's the message that Jesus is giving. We're on the offensive. We're not defensive, protecting ourselves. We're on the offensive here. And, and where's the offensive? How is it done? The keys of the kingdom. Proclaiming the forgiveness of sins. That's how the gates of hell are destroyed. That's how those who are in bondage are set free. That's how the captives are released. That's how the sinners are saved. When the, the keys of the kingdom, whether you bind us or bound in heaven, whether you loose us or loosed in heaven, the proclamation of the truth of God, the gospel, will bind and loose. Will bind the powers of darkness, will stop Satan's work, and free those are in bondage. It's all right there. Okay, we can go a little bit over an hour. What do you want to do? I'm done. Dale's done. Yeah, we've got to think about this. <clears throat> well, I'm giving you a whole lot of deep stuff because I, 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 I see stuff like this and like, man, I wrote a sermon on this and I did. It's no serious. <laughs> So, uh, we'll stop here. I want to show you one thing since I got it up on the screen. Let me just sit right there for a second. Because every now and then, I come up with something I kind of like. Uh, I just want to show you something real quick. Because I really did like this. Uh, rescue. That's the series graphic I made for the series I'm working on. Oh, I love that. Just a little baby. Uh, and I thought that was such a neat picture. Uh, I really like that graphic. So I made that as the theme graphic for the new sermon series I'm running. So you'll see that in a year. Well, in a year. well we, we beat the baby lambs. Yeah, He's you beat. <laughs> and are rescuing. Uh, well, let's pray. Father, thank you for times like this where we can be stretched and learn and grow and be excited about who you are as our God and what you've done for us in your son. Please bless us as we spend some time visiting and fellowshipping as we head home, continue to watch over our families and especially so many of us have had stressful weeks. Just give us your peace and continue to guide us as we live our lives in service to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, tomorrow's lunch.